Okay, great. Now onto the UFO question. Brian, when you say that scientists have an incentive to find life in the universe and the incentives via Nobel Prize and money, et cetera, I don't buy that per se. I think they have an incentive to find a certain form of life in the universe, but not life in general. And the reason is that life in general borders on what is considered to be woo or paranormal. For example, if you were to study UFOs and say, is there credibility to these, these reports? That's almost not done besides a few individuals like Kevin Knuth, for example, because I, I, I think almost none of us, I, I don't think any of us are actually pursuing the truth, including myself, which is why I don't like when people say this channel is for truth seekers. Almost none of us care about the truth per se, because the truth can be extremely hard. So we care about it in a certain bounded fashion. So we also care about our reputations. We care about not sounding like these insensate, decerebrate rednecks, which is what the people in the academy generally think of those who, who consider the UFO reports to be real. They, they generally consider them to, and let's be honest, they consider them to be kooks. And I think that academics generally care much more about either sounding intelligent or not appearing to be inane more than they care about the truth per se. And so it's, it's extremely bounded by their, by their place in a social hierarchy, by their place among their peers. They don't want to be ostracized. It's anathema to analyze UFO reports. So that's why I say, I don't buy when you say that, well, we have an extreme incentive to find life in the universe, a certain type of life, I agree. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think largely that is accurate, although I will say in my defense, you know, I did join the Galileo project with our mutual friend Avi Loeb, uh, specifically for this reason, not as a researcher, but as a member of the external oversight board, because I actually don't think they need my help as an observational astronomer. I'm, I'm pretty good, but, you know, Harvard uh, is not exactly hurting for, for money and, you know, they can certainly raise funding, especially when you have the, you know, uh, former uh, chairman, the longest serving chairman in Harvard's history in the astronomy department at the, at the helm, who's, you know, Joe Rogan's appearance blew up the internet and uh, has, has uh, you know, number five bestseller, um, you know, last year in the New York Times. List. So I don't think they need my help, you know, kind of necessarily doing the research. I do think they can always use help uh, holding them to account. And, you know, if I, I told this to Avi, you know, I wouldn't have called it the Galileo project. I think it's dangerous when, you know, uh, astronomers begin uh, by, you know, kind of bringing up the names like Bruno and, and Galileo and, and persecuted figures in history. I think that's a fraught, perilous endeavor. And I think I would be, even that is sort of a be, be lying a bias. In other words, his, his claim is that just like Galileo, uh, suffered from and the inability of the powers that be, the funding agencies of this time, the the uh, Venetian Doge and, and Senate and and other agencies to at first look through in the Catholic Church later on to look through his telescope and and see for themselves the as if that would have proven anything. I mean, just looking through a telescope proves nothing. It's the connection of the human mind and the formulation of a hypothesis and evidentiary data that could disconfirm his hypothesis. You know, Galileo had many blunders, Kurt. Uh, I'm pleased and privileged to be working with, uh, with uh, Jim Gates, Carlo Rovelli, Frank Wilczek, Fabiola Giannotti, and uh, my good friend from, uh, from uh, graduate school, Lucio Picciarillo, on the first ever audiobook version of any of Galileo's book. And it's- Oh, that's dialogue. interesting. And I also yeah, didn't so know that that was the genesis of the word Galileo in the project. I thought it just meant I'm going to be looking out like Galileo looked out. No, no. I mean, I, I think the project's really dangerous. I'd like to kind of push back on you. I mean, not push back. I'd like to reassure you. I mean, I can't speak for Brian. Just a second. Just a second, Lee. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just want Brian to finish because I, I interrupted him. And then, so please finish it's Brian okay, and, yeah. then, and then leave. Kurt's used to me interrupting Punch him. him. Punch uh, him. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we're translating Galileo's book. We have the rights to the first ever audiobook for Galileo. Uh, with a forward by Einstein, and uh, that's read by Frank Wilczek, winner of the Nobel Prize in 2004, and Jim Gates. It's a, so what does it say? It says Galileo was wrote the, the, the definitive treatise on the scientific method, on what you're supposed to do with evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And yet in that very book, he makes a catastrophic confirmation blunder. At the very end, on day four, it's a trialogue between these three characters. I'm one of them. Carlo Rovelli's the another one, and my friend Lucio's the other. And we go about, and we're trying to disprove uh, uh, Galileo's character, Salviati, is trying to disprove uh, the, uh, the, the Earth-centered notion of the universe that's held by Simplicio, the simpleton, uh, who is espousing the words of the Pope, uh, that the Earth is the center of the universe. And then I'm playing Sagredo, the kind of knowledgeable lay person who is interpreting between them. And Galileo is a phenomenal writer, uh, but he goes through and describes these things in such loving detail that even I become convinced 
when he goes about and says that the tides on the earth are proof that the earth is going around uh, the sun, that's complete balderdash. We know that's not correct, and it would take Newton to do it. And his argument is very simple and persuasive. It uses data. It would have gotten accepted by nature, probably, if, if nature had existed, not like, you know, Lee's travails. Um, but his argument is that you've got this, you know, you've got this object that's going around the sun. Here's the sun over here. And here we've got tides on the earth. And, uh, and it's, as it goes around the sun, it orbits and the tide sloshes around. And that's why we have tides. It's totally wrong. The tides are caused by the lunar gravitational force, the tidal force, quadrupolar moment of the lunar gravitational force field. Nothing to do with our motion around the sun, really. And yet it's incredibly persuasive. And so if you took the lessons of absolute objective history and you say, like, should we have listened to Galileo? No, you throw out that book. You throw it out. You say it's nonsense, even though the, he brings up relativity for the first time in human history. The notion of relative motion does not affect the laws of nature, which we now call Lorentz invariance. These are foundational things. And yet the summary of the book is totally wrong. The conclusion of the book is totally misproven. And he didn't use the best evidence in hand. So uh, look for that coming soon, hopefully on Galileo's birthday in February. But this is all to say when it comes to when it comes to Avi's project, Avi Loeb's project. Um, I think they need oversight more than they need my insight, which is to say that I think the, the first reaction that we have to have is skepticism because we do want to believe. I think if we all go back to our 12-year-old boys, when we were 12-year-old boys, forget about funding and, and I'm going to lose my, my, my status as a chair professor or Lee's going to lose. No, we're just little boys and we're, we're playing with that little pebble on the beach, like Newton said, and we're looking for a shinier pebble. If we were to discover that, I mean, it raises the hair on the back of my neck that there was extraterrestrial intelligence. First life, you know, I, I have my misgivings. I've talked to Lee about that. We'll talk about that some other time, but just about slime mold on the planet Enceladus is, or on the moon Enceladus. I don't think that will make as big an impact as, as Lee does, but let, let's leave that aside. Let's just talk about UFOs. I don't want to believe, I want to have evidence. And I think if you, if you bury your head in the sand, you won't get evidence. So I have to say, uh, and I hope this is true of Avi too, uh, that we are kind of the boy, boy, the 12 year old boys sitting on the, on the bed, not being able to fall asleep at night, looking up at the stars. We do want to know the truth, uh, but we want to have evidence for it as mature men, as scientists at this very moment. So anyway, Lee, you were going to say you've got some problems with, with, uh, with the project. And I'm happy. Again, I don't speak for them. I'm on their external advisory committee. I think it's important to do, but I am predisposed. It's like the bets that Stephen Hawking used to make with Kip Thorne. He would bet against Hawking radiation ever being, you know, validated. And uh, so that if he lost the bet, you know, he'd have the thrill of intellectual superiority being correct. <laughs> uh, so what say you, Lee? Yeah, I mean, it's no big, it's no big deal. I'm, I think I'm, I've got a lot of sympathy for Kurt's position uh, or, or kind of um, worry about where we are as scientists looking for UFOs. But I think that I know Avi very well. He's great, but he's playing a very strange game here, I would like to say. He's kind of saying, oh, the scientific establishment's not ready for this. I'm a genuine contrarian, and I'm just going to basically come up with these things I'm being ignored. No, he's just making stuff up, right? Making like what? stuff up. What, what, what is he making up? A theolocution with Lee Cronin and Avi Loeb is about to be booked. We got a plan. <laughs> yeah, so what I mean by he's making stuff up, he's making up a, a false argument about... Um, that people are kind of, you know, when it comes to this interstellar object that came through and he was just, he was saying why it could be alien space junk. Sure, it could be all sorts of things, but it, but we were trying to understand what the characteristics of trajectory were telling us. So he's kind of making up stories, which are fine. I don't mean he's fabricating stuff. I mean, he's saying a narrative. And I'm wondering why is he making that narrative? What does he have to gain? other than some kind of, you know, fame and notoriety and I'm going to be downtrodden by the establishment. Because if I suddenly said to Brian, hey, Brian, we've just found wormholes. I saw it over there. Look, wormhole over there, wormhole over there, wormhole over there. And, and then Brian says, Lee, you haven't got any wormholes. You just make, you know, you haven't got any data. And I'll be like, you're just beating me up, big professor, you know. And I think it's a bit like this. So what I, I'm really glad that Brian's I mean, that, that is side. kind of borderline ad hominem, Lee. I have to point that out. I mean, I'm, I love Avi. I fight with Avi. But but that seems like impugning his impugning his character almost. You can disassociate yourself from it. What I'm trying to say, to, to so it's not clipped out of context, is that I like the idea of searching, uh, but I there is this. So what I'm trying to say, there's this cultural vibe going on right now. Our culture is changing. People are asking questions. What are these things that the Pentagon has released? What is the probability of us this happening? Mm -hmm. And and I'm saying that we don't. We could play together. 
I would love to help Avi be successful. I, it doesn't, I don't think it's the, I don't think the establishment is against him. I don't think even I'm in the establishment, nor Brian. We genuinely want to know. And I do agree with you that there is some, we are putting, we could put our careers on the line if we get it wrong. But actually in science, you have become better scientists the more you're wrong. And yeah, what I'm saying here is right. Abby's adopting an extreme viewpoint where he may not allow himself to be wrong. And it's not an ad hominem. I'm not saying he's anything bad. I'm not saying he's doing anything dishonest. I'm saying he's making a narrative. Well, let's be precise. So I had him on my show <clears throat> and it was a wonderful episode. And this is long before I decided to join. And I said, Avi, I don't believe that you believe this is real, that this Oumuamua is an extraterrestrial. And he said, why? But I am. And, and I said, because if you did, you happen to have access to uh, a, a resource that's highly complex, has a lot of uh, uh, has a lot of assembly behind it called Yuri Milner, who is a Russian billionaire. And he's showered upon uh, you, the potential as a leader of, of the Breakthrough Starshot uh, Prize, one of the leaders, uh, this tremendous resource. So instead of sending you know, 10 to the fourth uh, cell phone cameras to Proxima Centauri B, why don't you send one of them at, you know, not even half the speed of life, not even 10% of the speed of just, you know, three, 4% of the speed of life and catch up to a more. And you know what he said? He said, no, 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 we don't need to do that because when Rubin Telescope, which is the Vera Rubin uh, uh, Observatory in Chile, <clears throat> which is going to be a phenomenal instrument, it's designed, it was the original name was the Large Scale Synoptic uh, uh, Survey Telescope to survey the whole sky with a huge cadence, very quickly, looking for objects that are anomalous, that could do, and he says that's one of the dream machines for discovering. We already discovered one of them using pan stars on Hawaii. Um, so we're going to discover millions of these things. I said, well, Avi, you know, I don't know if you know about this, but you know, like, uh, you know, sometimes you know, uh, things happen only once. You know, there's an end of one problem that we talk about. And what if this? Yeah, what if they are abundant? And what if there are forces that conspire against in our solar system, just particular, not to the cosmos, to our solar system, maybe the lunar, you know, so tidal solar, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and it makes these objects very, very unlikely to ever be seen again, even though they're abundant. Wouldn't you want to catch up to the only one with all the resources you have? And he was sort of agnostic about it. That gave yeah. me some pause. And that's one of the things I'm going to push back on as an external advisor. But I, I would... You know, and I love you, Lee, but but I don't think he's doing it for fame. I mean, he has an ego uh, that's well known. Um, he's he has trouble controlling, um, you know, sometimes his passions for what he does. I think he's doing an incredible, valuable service. But I just want to talk about from the perspective of as an observational astronomer, can observational astronomers provide information in the way that you've been using it about this phenomenon? Uh, in other words, we survey the sky in all wavelength bands, 24-7 around the Earth from Antarctica, where I've been twice for two months of my life, uh, and, and uh, to the North Pole, to space. Now we've got JWST. Um, what would it convince a believer to give up the, uh, the expectations? In other words, Carl Sagan said, lack of evidence is not evidence of absence or absence of evidence. So we can't, but we can't, we also have to admit we have conserved resources in finite time, which is the most prominent of all resources. So let me just come in quickly. So I completely agree with all characters, right? And I know Abby is great. Uh, all I'm trying to say is um, we, I want him to help. I want him to succeed. So exactly. I, I think my, the only thing I would comment is say, how can we help you? Let's help, let's help you do this, right? Whatever yeah. you think the narratives are, it's capturing the day. Yeah. I do think we have a responsibility though. And it's not an ad hominem. It is kind of a bit way in this polarization in the time of COVID elections, we do have a responsibility for correctly framing the arguments. So we're not leading people down the guard, up the garden path. That's the only point I'm getting at. So I mean being too optimistic or being too high salesman. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Exist. That's all I mean, nothing else. Everything else is good. So what I would say to Abby is like, how can we help you? And what I would say to Kurt is like, what do you think science, science, mainstream science is doing enough of you're finding frustrating? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cheap scientist in the regard that, I want to know why I'm in the universe. I want to know why I'm here. I want to have meaning. If there are aliens out there, I want to know. It's not just the right type of alien. Any will do me. Any evidence. Um, and, and I, we and have I to talk hear, about I that. Feel you're getting meaning from science and meaning from life in the universe. That might have to be a part two, uh, Kurt. But, but anyway, yeah, I know we both want, want, we want evidence, right? We don't want to just you know, yeah. just ma marginally. And we only have finite amount of time and, and intellectual time. But don't forget, you know, uh, our forgetting curve, you know, is peaking. I can tell you from experience in a few years, 
you're going to have trouble remembering your kids' names and, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, n- that'll stop. But, <laughs> uh, but, but we only have so much time for attention to pay attention to things of, 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 of great import to us. So I, I, you know, I guess the, the subject is what, what else should we be doing? We being astronomers, obviously not going to build, you know, a, a large Hadron Collider squared, you know, to look for uh, interdimensional aliens, you know, manipulating wormholes to get here. Right. He's, he's an astronomer. He's a theorist, by the way, he's not an observer. So, so I think he needs help. Uh, I think the, the, you know, having you involved, you know, from that perspective, but then how do we translate the signatures from assembly from, you know, can be ta- how do we translate that into an actionable metric that will allow us to reduce our uncertainty, getting back to our rubric at the beginning of this conversation. Well, let me answer one direct thing. I think we can do this with image data and time series data. And Hmm. one of the things that would be very interesting is like if you take any given image on its dimensionality, and let's say, I mean, Kurt, you've got assembly in one second. It's brilliant, right? You can apply the same thing to two-dimensional images and also time series images. Of course, you have to define your axioms precisely, like right. when you're looking at how this image image can be created. Yeah, it's very not, rare you see like a straight edge in nature. It just doesn't happen, right? You're, so you're looking for it. Yeah, I mean, and so I, was, I think that's right. And I, 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 what I would say, um, Kurt, quickly is, I've looked at these Pentagon images and I spoke to someone who was responsible for releasing some of them. And I was like, are you just trying to basically, are you just, were you bored one day or did you need more funding or something? Why did you do it? And they were like, no, actually, we genuinely think public paid for this data in a way and we're just throwing it out there. So when I, when I try to get out of them, what they thought, they wouldn't tell me. So what do you think of these images? I mean, you must have, I've looked at them. I've listened to people on podcasts, on Joe Rogan's podcast in particular, and looked at the data. And there's all this mischaracterization of different people looking at different data sets and saying things like there's this object that I think Brian you've talked about this 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 uh this tic tac that went from supposedly you know um very high up to 50 feet off the ocean in like a second um what do but Kurt you have a look at this data what do you think of it do you think it's compelling or or you, are you frustrated about the quality or, or, or what what is your opinion I think it's sad that people hold these as as evidence of UFOs because I don't think they are necessarily. I think that they're extremely poor evidence. And what about sightings? What about what about uh, eyewitnesses? That, 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 so that's why them? all of it has to be looked at. So when someone, mm-hmm. if someone is to tell me that Bigfoot exists and I ask for footage and then they show me some pixelated video, I don't think that that's great evidence for Bigfoot. Now that in tandem with a variety of stories from people who we would think of as credible in any other situation, that in tandem with, let's say a rape trial, we would send someone to jail based on two or three witness testimonies. And yet we have a team of people who are extremely credible, who testify to the strangeness of this phenomenon. And then we don't, we think, well, perhaps their eyes are misleading them. Well, I don't think that's reasonable. So I think it's strange. I don't find any single one of the videos to be compelling. I find the set of videos to be somewhat compelling that there's something strange happening, but I find the total set of, I'm putting evidence in scare quotes here, evidence of UFOs to be interesting. And I also don't believe that we want to believe in UFOs. I know that you said that, Brian. I know. Well, I want to believe in, I want to have evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned that we have this need to believe in external life. And I don't think that's true for me personally. I hope that all of what's happening with UFOs is false. Well, Lee said something, sorry, Kurt. uh, Well, I'm just afraid of the implications. And I think that anyone who seriously thinks about this perhaps should be, because it may indicate that we're not at the top of the food chain. It may mean that we don't mean what we think we mean in terms of our place in the universe, our purpose even. I feel the same way about the prospects of hell. I don't want to believe in hell. Not that I do, but I don't want to believe in it. In some ways, I don't want to believe in God. In some ways, I find comfort in that consciousness ends. So there are so many beliefs that people say, well, people have a need to believe in, in God. People have a need to believe in UFOs. Some do, some don't. And I think that if you seriously thought about UFOs, perhaps perhaps you would want to believe that they don't exist. When I say UFOs, I mean, obviously UFOs exist. The alien life that's supposedly behind it is what I'm referring to. All right. Well, I think that exemplifies why you're one of the best in the business, Kurt, and what you do on this, on this channel uh, and that you have uh, this, you know, kind of uh, humility, epistemological humility, uh, but you also have uh, tenacity and that is a rare combination. Um, I, I think, you know, one, one nice place maybe to wrap up and, and, you know, Lee, Lee is often, 
I, I claim in a good sense, you know, my, my belief fundamentally is that no one's an atheist. Everyone has a religion, you know, for some, even the, that don't go to, you know, church or synagogue, you know, that religion, as I documented in my first book, you know, losing the Nobel Prize, it is often the Nobel Prize. And this is kind of a, a kosher idol, you know, that, yeah, it doesn't cause that much harm. And yeah, funding decisions are made on it. And, you know, Lee's mentioned it more times than I have today. And it's obviously, you know, top of mind for many scientists and, and Zygazun, hopefully he would win it. I don't have anything against the people that win it. I've interviewed a dozen of them on my show, but on the other hand, um, you know, there, even lack of a religion, secularism, um, I think that there is a religion of scientism, which is that uh, science can provide meaning. And I, I'd like to push back on that. I'd like to explore what Lee and you think, Kurt, about this very notion. In other words, uh, the word science in, 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 uh, in, in, in Greek uh, means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. You know, sapien means wisdom. You know, one who knows that he knows sapienism. I, I talked about this with Lex Friedman on the podcast that just came out. And look forward, by the way, to Lee Cronin, who inspired me, you know, to, to, to you know, get connected to Lex again. Uh, you know, Lex uh, hosted Lee before me. And uh, Lee helped me prepare a lot for my episode because he was on Lex's show and he'll hopefully have that episode out soon too. Might have been, yeah. allegedly. We never I, know. I can't wait to see that one. But, <laughs> you know, I talked about this, you know, that that I don't get any meaning from science. I, I think science, science is intrinsically, inherently, you know, we may have curiosity and the motto of my channel is ABC, always be curious. Uh, but curiosity and wisdom don't necessarily go together. And I documented many times, you know, Nobel laureates that were Nazis, you know, and had great knowledge and used their knowledge of of, of chemicals and, you know, forefathers, you know, Fritz Haber, you know, Lee, Lee could tell you way you more about Fritz Haber, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just evil, you know, and, and he was a Jew and his and his and his, uh, his Zyklon B eventually led to the gassing mm. of many of his own family members. So anyway, don't look to science for wisdom. So if you can't look into it for wisdom, why do we look to it for meaning? So Lee, uh, I can I can give you a quick answer, but maybe Kurt, okay. it's your show. Whether you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. 